wooden canopy to help curb the heat, a sewer line to dispose of wastewater, and one electrical connection. A modern bathhouse containing men's and women's sections was available for every 30 trailers. These were equipped with lavatories, toilets, shower rooms, and a laundry room with four wash tubs. The rooms were in constant use and became the social gathering place for residents. Since trailers were too small for entertaining, block parties were held in the laundry rooms where electric washers served as tables for potluck dishes. It was like living in a big walk-in closet. My, I converted a bedroom to a closet in my house. And I've got California closet shelves up one side for shoes and all that stuff. And I've got more room in there, I think, than we had in that trailer. I kid you not. <laughs> the social life was at the washroom. <laughs> That's where the bulletin board was, and, and it was just the only place there was to hang out for the kids, especially. You know, my sister, that was the one thing my sister and brother both mentioned, was that they hung out at the washroom. And, uh, and, and not to wash, it was just to hang out. It was some place that was covered, you know, that uh, you could get in out of the wind and rain and so forth. The trailer people, uh, I think, uh, adapted to life around here really easy. I, I'm, not, I'm not really sure why, but I think they did better than, than the other people that moved into a house right away. It was really tough on women around here. It was real hot, and there wasn't no air conditioning in those days. And so it was generally the woman's idea to move out of town. In a lot of cases, the men were willing to put up with the misery because the money was good. But uh, some of the life was some of the life was so tough that the women, they, said, no, they didn't want to put up with it. And so, if you want to be married with me, we're leaving right now. So. People came from every state in search of work. Most were unprepared for the desert conditions, for the secrecy, the lines, the heat and dust made family life far from the ordinary. A walk through the streets read like a history lesson. Streets were named for U.S. generals, including Doolittle and Eisenhower, and places and names in the news, such as Bataan and Guadalcanal. Two grocery stores, four ice houses, a lumber yard, two automobile service stations, an electrical fiction shop, and even a dog pound were set up to service this trailer city. A schoolhouse and gymnasium for children up to eighth grade were located in the main camp area. High school students were furnished free bus transportation to neighboring Richland. All needs were factored in, including 24-hour patrol duty, public health services, fire protection rights, surface streets, 24-hour cafeterias, and weekly entertainment. All part of the critical morale effort, as worker turnover was constant. Well, it was... Uh interesting and then we kept saying well we're not going to be here very long and this will be fine <laughs> but it was kind of fun really I, you, everybody was in the same boat you develop routines uh, and that were beneficial to the you know to the family and uh, you were responsible to do certain things and you just did them and that, that made life easy for everybody to give you an example of what I'm talking about is they used to have what they called the porcelain bucket brigade, and that was a, a chamber pot. So none of, the trailer, none of the trailers had bathrooms, and even if they did, they, were, they had no hookup for the bathroom. They did have a hookup for your sink to take gray water, but they had nothing for sanitary. So you had to utilize the washrooms where the bathroom facilities were located. And so in the morning, you would see all the ladies headed for the wash house with this porcelain bucket to to dump it and wash it out and bring it back to the trailer. Well, that was, in the early days, that was the only women did that. You know, then finally, I don't know, somebody spotted a man doing one, and pretty soon the wives were beating on their husbands, so then it would became anybody's job. And then it finally got down to us kids were doing it. <laughs> and so in the morning, that was uh, my brother and I's job, too. One of us had to take the, the porcelain pot over and and dump it and wash it out and bring it back. Well, I suppose we, well, we had to get up early and, and have breakfast because then my brother and sister took the bus to school in Richland and it was 26 miles round trip. 
to school in Richland, and they were both still in school. I was out of school, but they were both still in school. And of course, then my mom and I would do the washing and, and go and, and do the shopping and do the standing in line bit. One of us would stand in one line and one another line and so that we could get it done faster. Men would line up for a city block, standing in line, to get to the drugstore, and I think we had about 20, maybe 20 seats. And it was a long... Uh, long bar. Long bar. Mm -hmm. you call it, is that a bar? I, I guess. It was, it was about 20, counter. Maybe more. And then they'd stand behind a seat and be 14, 15 people deep. So there were 300 people there waiting to get a... a dish ice cream at one time. A thousand new faces show up every day. Over half take one look, then go on their way. From one to two weeks is the average we know. The weak ones turn chicken, the strong make the dough. A transfusion of dust about twice a day drives all honest thoughts of staying away. You spend a hard day in clearing your slate. You cuss and you damn, then terminate. Trailerites took great pride in their tiny lots. Seeds and hoses were provided to tie down the desert soil with gardens and flowers. Many adorned their lots with picket fences and rock pathways. Trailers were too small and too hot for long periods of occupancy. Residents spilled into the streets to discuss the day's events with neighbors, while carefully choosing their words, since you never know who may be listening. Children found ways to entertain themselves. Many young entrepreneurs shined shoes or sold soda pop to thirsty workers as they left their shifts. And they did it right where the guys got off the buses and sold these coal pops just as fast as they could. We had we had stacks and stacks of Coke bottles empty, and they'd load them up and take them back and get more. <laughs> and it was constant, almost, you know, every day. And every day, these kids were, I don't know what they charged, but it was like double what it should have been well, at, at that time, or maybe triple. And I, I delivered papers into the trailers, and then I gave that up, and I took a, a, a job selling papers in the mess hall. And uh, that was really really a lucrative job, or I thought it was, you know, I was just a kid, but, you know, newspapers in those days were only a uh, nickel apiece, and uh, almost every worker gave me uh, at least a dime, uh, and a few uh, people made a deal with me ahead of time that they said, you always have a paper with, for me to sit down at the table and read while I eat, if you do that, I'll give you a quarter every day. And so I made a quarter off the paper. And a lot of those guys were really nice. They would be very careful about how they read the paper. They would, they would carefully read it, and they would put it back together. And then when they, on their way out, they would give it back to me, and I'd resell it. <laughs> food was probably one of the largest morale boosters, and food was plentiful. Eight 24-hour mess halls were open for camp and construction residents. 25 million meals were served through these mess halls with the equivalency of 50 tons of food per meal. Entertainment was always available. A movie house ran 24 hours a day and top name bands such as Kay Kaiser performed regularly. Entertainers were generally brought in and out of the camp at night so they didn't get much of an idea of the kind of place they had visited and its location. A baseball field, skating rink, billiard room, dance hall, and library were available to keep the residents' minds occupied on recreation and not on the concrete structures that were rising quickly above the desert landscape. They provided a lot of inducement to get people to come here. I didn't want people to leave. <laughs> because uh, I know my husband said that he wanted to leave a lot of times before he met me because he just got so lonesome. They realized after they got started on construction, they were lo losing a lot of people, leaving again. They were, I guess the estimate is something like 151,000 people cycled through the place. And so they realized they were going, it was an, a valued added expenditure to build the auditorium and build the theater so they would have people stay long enough to 
finish the place.